Hello, guys. How are you tonight? Glad to have you here. I'm going to have a little talk about a few things. I'm going to get it get into a few issues in the news and a little bit of depth. First about Italy and then about the Brexit. And then the next thing I'm going to talk about is Federal Reserve. And I'm going to talk about the very start of the Federal Reserve. And I'm going to talk about just exactly why this economic crisis we got coming has to happen. It has to happen. There's no way out. Anyway, so let's get started. Let's get the charts open right here. And first, let's take a look at uh, Italy here. Uh, Italy is headed for a vicious debt crisis. And uh, this is an article I found. It's just uh, it's the latest on Italy. It says, after the briefest, weakest of economic recoveries, Italy has succumbed to its third recession in a decade. It risks further undermining Italian support for the euro. Particularly considering Italy's living standards today are below those enjoyed 20 years ago when the country adopted the single currency. Ahead of the European Parliament elections in May, Italy's populist government is becoming more radical. Okay, so see the Five Star Movement got in power. And it talks about the Five Star Movement right here. It, uh, it's, it says here that uh, this week he, uh, they've threatened... This is, I guess, Deputy Minister Matteo Savini has called for the central bank's leadership to be removed for failing to prevent Italy's banking crisis. This week, he threatened to seize control of the country's gold reserves and sell them to fund further government spending. You know, Italy's just had huge boosts. The European Union you knows about 41, I think it's 41 billion dollars worth of Italian bonds. As long as Italy can keep selling those bonds, Italy will probably remain afloat. Now France has got 260 billion euros worth of Italian bonds, Italian debt. The, they just sold another like 41 billion, I think, worth of Italian debt. And this, this, is, this is what's keeping them afloat right now, right now. But you know, giving Italy money is like, say money is like water, and you ever seen one of those things that uh, colanders that they drain spaghetti with? It's got all the holes in it. I think they call it a sieve. It's like pouring water into a sieve. I mean, it's not going to last very long. It's going to run right out. The money is, and that and then they're going to be right back where they started again. And Italy is a huge problem. I mean, a huge problem. Uh, Italian government now is gross borrowing needs are close to 275 billion euros a year. <laughs> this is, like I say, they're a sieve. Can you imagine? Their gross borrowing needs are close to a staggering 275 billion dollars a year. So they just got 41 billion. Uh, you break that down into 275 billion a year. Uh, I mean, it's going to give them a few months, you know. Italy, the money's just going to drain out of Italy. They just gave them thirty billion not long ago during their banking crisis. A lot of people forget about that. That had to come back back onto the Italian debt. Their debt is staggering. It's in the trillions, you know. And two hundred and sixty billion euros of that is France's. France can't cover that two hundred and sixty billion because it would create a hole, and then they would have to. I mean, it's just it's, the whole thing's just a mess, guys. Uh, let's move on and let's talk about Theresa May here for a minute. Uh, here's the key part in all of this right here. And this is huge to the Brexit. Uh, and this news has just come in. It's the newest news on the Brexit. It says on Tuesday, Mrs. May said members, she said members of parliament would be able to vote to extend the March 29th deadline for the United Kingdom to leave the EU if she is unable to win a parliamentary support for a Brexit deal with the bloc. Now, I think she's probably not going to be able to get parliamentary support for that Brexit deal with the bloc. I think I don't think she's going to be able to get it. It's going to be way late in March by the time they do the vote, right about the middle of March. That doesn't leave them much time. It only leaves them two weeks. So she said on Tuesday that members of Parliament would be able to vote to extend the March 29th deadline. Uh, the thing about this is 
they're probably going to come down to that vote, and they're probably going to vote to extend the March 29th deadline. But they did say it's going to be only a small extension. But this is key. Uh, the hard Brexit was supposed to come on the 29th, and if they extend that deadline, it means that they're going to push it off into the future. How long? Who knows? Probably three months, six months, nine months. I don't know. And then when they get to the deadline again, they could just postpone it again. I mean, this whole thing just could keep the whole thing going in limbo forever, you know. So so this would be no Brexit, not a hard Brexit, not a soft Brexit, no Brexit if that happens. So we got to keep our eye on that. Now, I wanted to talk to you about the Fed. Here's the thing, guys. When the Fed was started back in 1914, they met at a place called Jekyll Island, you know. And they were bankers, and they can't hatch the plan. And basically, to nit, get to the nitty gritty of what the plan is, it's a it's a Ponzi scheme. Basically, what they do is they create money. The Federal Reserve has the power to actually create money, and the money that they create is like lent out, and it requires interest to be paid. But what they don't do is they don't create the money that's needed to pay the interest that accrues on the debt. So now, if you try to pay the debt off in these kind of circumstances, what ends up happening is, is there's not enough money to go around to pay the debt, ever, because they didn't create it. Uh, the way this whole thing is orchestrated, is orchestrated as a Ponzi scheme that's dependent on something. What it's dependent on, dependent on is always borrowing more and more and more to keep the money supply inflated. So what this whole thing relies upon, this, this Ponzi scheme, is constant inflation. And if it starts to deflate, the whole thing blows up, basically. It blows up. So they can't let it deflate. The central bank cannot let, ever let it deflate. But at the same time, they got to be careful that the inflation doesn't run away on them and they get into a hyperinflation. So they've always been trapped in this whole thing of an, an ever-expanding money bubble. It's a, it's a Ponzi scheme. It relies upon exponential growth, slowly grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, but the world that we live in is not infinite. So if you get something that's growing exponentially at a certain point, the monetary supply exceeds industry. It exceeds everything else, right? And But in this case, it cannot exceed industry. It cannot exceed the world's manufacturing and the world's GDP and everything else because once it does, then the monetary supply starts to contract because people stop borrowing and stuff because the whole world industry has basically filled the whole world and the world is finite and, and it's... It's done. It's spread to its limit. That's what happened in 2008. Basically, it was a contraction of everything in the world. Contracted. But what they did was, is when they got that contraction, they artificially inflated the monetary supply, whereas the world itself was still saturated. It all, it's all been done. So the world has reached its point of exponential growth. And it's starting to shrink. But what they've done is, is they've used the money. They've used this money, this artificially increasing the monetary system during the contraction in order to try and get the world to grow just a little bit bigger, to keep this whole Ponzi scheme going a little bit longer. And so basically what they've done is they've actually done an excellent job since 2008 till now Supporting a Ponzi system, supporting a Ponzi scheme that requires exponential growth in a world that's finite. It's amazing. What they've done is, is they've made a balance between deflation and inflation, and they've ridden that line. It's like a razor's edge between deflation and inflation. They've ridden that line, and they've just pumped enough money into the system, which was absorbed. The money that they pumped into the system, most of it was absorbed because of the deflationary challenge that was created when we had the first contraction in 2008. 
that deflationary contraction was so strong that in order just to stop it, they needed X amount of dollars flooded into the system. And they gave it, just said, they gave it the X amount of dollars it needed to stop the contraction. So basically, in 2008, we, we bought it, we nosedived down to a certain level. And then they stopped the contraction. And basically, we've been bottom bouncing. Our economy has been bottom bouncing ever since. With maybe a slightly moving upwards, but mostly bottom bouncing. And they've been balancing that ever since. But they've been balancing it by over leveraging the system. Creating credit bubbles. And adding money and liquidity into the system. So now, where are we right now? Where we are is to a point we have an over leveraged system and, and this is creating pressures within the financial system that's causing tremendous volatility. So what they've done is is they're they're backdoor in the system now and they're keeping it running. And they're trying to do things like quantitative tightening, but at the same time other central banks are not following suit. So we're just coming to a point now where the Fed realizes that if they continue with the quantitative tightening that they're doing, that there's going to be a major contraction, just like in 2008. And so they've backed off the pedal somewhat, and they're backing off the pedal. They don't want that contraction. So in order to avoid the contraction, what they're going to do is inflation's going to start to heat up. So what they're doing is... is they're trying to kill one thing while they're stimulating something else. So there's neither direction they can actually move. Ultimately, what's going to happen is this inflation is going to erode the dollar to a point where people are going to lose confidence in it. But before that point in time, before we actually get to the point where people lose confidence in the dollar, we're looking at a, a, a heating up of inflation. You know? And it all depends if the Fed wants to really continue with, and they, and they 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 don't back off the pedal with their with their uh, quantitative tightening, then we'll get a contraction, and then they'll have to then they'll have to really go into heavier stimulus measures. But uh, it seems like they're going to back off the pedal first before we get the major contraction. And so what we're looking at is inflation coming because they're going to back off the pedal. We're look going to look at the uh, if they actually follow through on what they're saying and they end quantitative tightening in a couple months and they actually uh, bypass a, uh, a rate hike, you know, if they do both of those things, then what we're going to start to see is we're going to start to see the dollar start to move, lose power. The dollar is going to start to settle back down into the lower 90s toward, eight, the eight, toward the 80s on the U.S. dollar index. And we're going to see the velocity of money starting to pick up. And at a certain point, we're going to have a real economic recovery if, in, if, uh, if they start to have to go back to stimulus measures, which they've talked about. So we really got to keep an eye on this big time because everything the Fed does is what's going to actually affect the, the economy. The Fed's everything, you know. It's what they do that affects the outcome of what I report on. And so I have to follow the trends, and the trends has everything to do with what the Fed does. Now, a few months back, maybe six months or eight months ago, I reported that we were heading for a major economic contraction, what I call the deflationary spike event. But the Fed, as they've done somewhat of an about face and that has everything to do on what I'm reporting on and how the outcome's going to be now now the pictures change somewhat because of what the Fed's done and so that's why we have to watch what the Fed's doing right now it's speak they haven't really taken any uh, positive action in, in in any direction yet but they've indicated what they're going to do and if they follow through on those actions we are actually going to see, uh, instead of a contraction, we could actually see the stock market continue to go up. If they, It depends on how hard they, they, they don't do the quantitative tightening and, and how much stimulus they come back to 
We're talking about quantitative easing again. I think that the Fed is yielding much faster than I thought they would. I thought they would go further into this. And uh, they haven't. They're yielding quicker. Uh, but uh, like I say, everything's got to do with the Fed. Thank you guys for listening. Like and subscribe. And we'll catch you in the next show. Bye-bye, guys.